250 million people all over the world play football and 5 billion fans are watching them play every day in the fields, on TV, on internet, in the stadiums. Football is by far the most popular sport in the world. Revenues last year from TV rights, from sponsorships and gate receipts were in excess of $35 billion and growth rate is 9%. Um, of the fans, 30% are women. Of the players, only 15% are women and girls. And when you go to the regulatory agencies like FIFA, UEFA, member associations, 209 countries, uh, European Club Association, female representation on the boards is only 8%. And currently in the world there are only two female presidents of the federations and only two general secretaries who are female. So I work in an industry where the ceiling is actually not glass, it's concrete cement, where the express elevator doesn't even have a button in it, and the staircase is a jungle gym. But against all odds, somehow I made it in this industry. I was the first female general manager and the third female board member of Galatasaray first female general secretary of the Turkish Football Federation and the second one in the world and the first female executive board member of the European Club Association. So, as you can tell, I am passionate about football and my purpose is to lead the way for more women in football leadership and hope to leave a legacy behind. I'll tell you the three main crossroads that I passed in my life. The first one was in the second year of my career. I was working for Morgan Stanley in New York, uh, working on the largest capital markets transaction ever to date, $2 billion offering of General Motors. And on the side, I was uh, trying to complete my Harvard Business School applications and uh, working 120 hours a week. And my boyfriend, Attila Köksal, who was living in Istanbul at the time, proposed. My heart stopped. I listened to my heart and, of course, said yes, came back to Turkey, got married. And the good news is, after 23 years, we're still married. Our son, Alp, is 16 and a half years old. He is the valedictorian of his class at Üsküdar Amerikan uh, Academy. He is a swimmer with more than 100 medals, national medals, and he is a musician. He loves playing piano, saxophone, and also the guitar. Our daughter Ella is 15 years old, and she's a very successful student at ENCA, and she's also a lover of animals. She is also a swimmer, a fencer, and also plays football. The little baby in the picture is my nephew. He started his life out in a very unfortunate uh, way. Uh, the hospital mixed him up. The 24 hours later, he was delivered to his mom, only to lose her after seven days uh, to a very rare blood disorder that the hospital could not detect and could not cure, unfortunately. So since then, he's been living with us, together with my brother. And as long as I live, he will be my third child. The second crossroad actually came uh, in the ninth year of my career. I was working for a private equity fund, and the fund uh, invested in Galatasaray after nine months of joining the, the fund. And I worked on that project because I was a Galatasaray fan and I knew the president. And uh, my daughter was born actually on the same day as the investment of the fund uh, happened. And a month into my maternity leave, my boss calls me in and says, well, Ebru, with two very young children, uh, we think that the pace at the fund could be a little bit too fast for you. So why don't you work at Galatasaray for six months? I was furious. I was hurt. I walked out. I hired a lawyer. I was opening a court case. And then uh, Mr. Faruk Suren, the legendary president of Galatasaray, he said, oh, come on, give it a chance. Work with us for six months. If you don't like it, you can always go back and reopen your court case. So I did. 
and it's been a wonderful 15 years at the club. Uh, I worked with six different presidents, uh, 10 different boards, over 100 different board members before I became a board member myself. When I joined, the budget of the club was only 20 million euros. Today it's 200 million euros. And we have 500 employees, 1,200 athletes who are uh, competing on behalf of the club. But it was very difficult to explain to my children what I do for a living. So when they were three and four years old, one weekend we went on a ski trip. And on the way back from Bursa, I was going to get off the ferry, run over to the Olympic Stadium to watch a derby match. And the kids kept asking me, Mom, you know, why are you going to the match? I said, well, I work for Galatasaray. Uh, Mom, what do you do for Galatasaray? So I'm trying to explain. You know the jerseys that the players wear? We make them and we sell them. You know, on TV, you're sometimes watching the games. We produce the matches and sell them to the TV stations. Um, so I keep on explaining. And then I turned around and I, I said, did you understand? And my son said, yeah, you're a football player. <laughs> Why on earth would you go on a Sunday night after a ski trip to a football match? The biggest challenge uh, during my time at Galatasaray, in 2009, the president uh, was uh, Adnan Polat at the time. He called me to his office and he said, you take over this. It's the stadium construction. It had stopped for six months and there was no hope of finishing it in the near future. I went to his office every day for a week. I cried and cried and asked that I would be relieved of this project and he said no. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He told me that this was the most important project in the history of Galatasaray that would change the face of the club for the next decades to come and that I was his most trusted employee and he couldn't trust this project to anybody else. So I rolled up my sleeves and lived in this construction site for two years, pulled a team of experts. I didn't know how to run a construction project, but I had very good advisors. This is six months before the opening with my sales team. Uh, still a very long way to go. This is three months before the opening. The roof is in place. No seats and no grass on the pitch, <laughs> as you can see. But somehow we managed to pull everything together and the stadium opened in January 2011. And if any one of you ever go to the stadium, remember that this is my fourth child. <laughs> The proudest moment for me uh, was when I decided to stand for election at the European Club Association back in 2010. Everyone said, oh, how courageous and how cute, you know, what you'll never win. I said, okay, <laughs> let's give it a try. I called up every single club that was going to vote at the election. I explained to them my background. I told them my projects. I said why I would be a very good candidate. And on the day of the election, when I was called up to the stage as the only, the first and only female executive, uh, it was the proudest moment for me. I served together with the leading club presidents like Karl-Heinz Rummenigge from Bayern Munich, president of Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester United. And of course, this comes with some perks as well. Every year at the General Assembly, the big football family plays football. <laughs> And what do I have to do? Get on the pitch and play with them. And Waldo is here in the middle. <laughs> My Oscar moment, I was awarded the Executive of the Year Award in 2011 for restructuring Galatasaray's debt, for finishing the stadium, and also paving the way for more women to get in the industry and uh, come into leadership positions. So I was in a very, very comfortable position, made a lot of achievements, and, um, but of course something was itching. There was a, a dream job out there. And in 2011, I was asked to become the first general secretary, female general secretary of the Turkish Football Federation. This time it was not a very easy decision for me because um, in, if you recall, it was during the match-fixing investigations and I didn't want to be part of that uh, ordeal at all. So uh, for a month, I negotiated with Mr. Mehmet Ali Aydınlar, who promised me that I would have nothing whatsoever to do with this investigation. 
Um, I went in to do a major restructuring project. In three months, we completely changed the uh, organizational structure within the Federation. And the project uh, won an award by FIFA, and I was asked to go and present at the General Assembly where 54 countries would be present. And I got on stage and presented to an all-male audience. It was a wonderful presentation. I sat down looked at my phone, there were 38 missed calls. I said, okay, there was either an earthquake or somebody died or there was a revolution in the country. Actually, while I was on stage and praising this president and the administration for all the great work they've done and the vision that they had, um, they actually resigned while I was on stage. <laughs> so I came back home and uh, tried to work with the new president and the new administration for two months, but it became very clear that the way of doing business and the approach to business was very different, so we decided to mutually terminate my contract after four months and five days, so that is the extent of my dream job. But it doesn't stop there, because while I was gone, my position at Galatasaray was taken, and worst uh, for that short period of time I worked there, I was publicly accused, harassed and threatened for decisions that the Federation took during my time there. And I had nothing to do with those decisions. So, what is this called? It is a crucible. <laughs> this happens to many of us in our lives. Uh, when it's happening, it feels like the airplane crashed. This is 1972, the rugby team, famous rugby team. 16 people survived for 78 days by unfortunately eating their dead friends. So uh, what I lived through was my crucible. And how did I get over it? As Nelson Mandela says, the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, because we all fall, but in rising every time we fall. So I got up you know, cleaned my wounds and started running again, as I always did in the 47 years of my life. So I signed a consulting agreement with FIFA in 2012, and I have so far um, taught, held workshops, and visited 32 countries to spread the knowledge and spread my experience. And it's been very, very uh, rewarding to inspire young women and men in lesser developed countries to develop football. And I also uh, became a board member at Galatasaray in 2013, and I had the honor to serve for two years on the board. So I work in sports, and people always ask me whether I do sports myself. Yes, I was a swimmer since I was seven years old. I played water polo, I played basketball, and um, I had to wait 47 years to win my first gold medal. But the good news is, if you wait long enough, the competition disappears, and you're the only one. <laughs> I run, and I play football, Khizlar Sahada. Um, what's been my formula? I know my purpose. <clears throat> I know my passion. I know my motivations, and they're all aligned. I know my strengths and capabilities and weaknesses and vulnerabilities. I'm a very driven person. I set high standards for myself and for the people around me. I'm resilient, I think, as I could show to you. Uh, I'm very courageous. I stand up. I fight. I speak, I can take difficult decisions. I'm a problem solver. I don't make problems, but I actually solve problems. And I'm a trustworthy person. People can trust me for delivering good results. But at the very base, of course, is knowledge and a continuous drive for personal growth. I never stop reading, I never stop learning. I nourish my extended family and my network. And of course, last but not least, for me, values and ethical boundaries have been very, very important. And I practice them under no matter what condition I'm in. I did something very scary <laughs> two weeks ago. We were in Sydney. And uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge is one of the only bridges in the world that you can climb. And uh, my children wanted to take this adventure, uh, but the bad news is I really have a bad high anxiety. I'm very scared of heights. 
But I said, okay, you know, I'm going to give it a try. And this is a three-hour <laughs> event. The first hour is propping you, and then you start the climb. And uh, that one and a half hours was torture for me. It, I was on a very narrow platform, steel mesh, holding on to these really tiny rails on the side, and I could see what I was walking on. My knees were shaking, my heart was running a mile a minute, and I was white as limestone. I was going to faint, I wanted to go back, turn around and quit. Uh, but somehow I made it to the top. Made it. Scary. <laughs> we are making our country proud. Yes. When I was up at the top, I said to myself, why did you get so scared? This is exactly what you've been doing for the last 15 years in the football industry. So it was a wonderful, wonderful experience and you need to overcome your fears. So what's next for me? I'm waiting patiently for the next high tide. But the most important question, what's next for you? Thank you.